Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, selected verses. Because let's be honest, the story is kind of long. So get comfortable, and as you listen to this narrative, I want you to imagine it playing out like an ancient drama night, where there's a stage up front with two characters all lit up at a time, interacting with one another, leaving the stage so that another person can come up and interact. Basically, a constantly rotating cast of characters. This particular story was written in the dramatic style, and the groups of people that you'll hear about in the text, like the disciples, the community, and the religious leaders, would have been played by one actor or character. Let's get started. John 9, verses 1 through 39. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread it on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and he washed back and he came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, no, no, but it's somebody like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus had made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. The religious leaders did not believe that he had been born blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? And then does he now see? Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, though I was born blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sin, and you were trying to teach us, and they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Amen. Whew. So there are a lot of moving pieces in this story, right? There's a whole cast of characters moving through the scenes, arguing with one another, and trying to figure out who this Jesus fellow is. By the end of this Gospel of John narrative, there is no character who has not been transformed by the experience. Despite the relative power and privilege that some of the characters have, they're all impacted by Jesus' encounter with the blind person. Their privilege cannot shield them from the effects that this miracle has on their community. I think it's common that when we read the Bible, we like to imagine ourselves as the people that Jesus comes to help. In hearing this story, many of us, myself included, like to think of ourselves as the blind person, 
the person who had an interaction with Jesus and our whole life changed for the better, right? I mean, it comes from, sorry, we've come from darkness to light. We were blind, but how we see now, right? I mean, let's be honest. How much do you get into singing Amazing Grace during a worship service? A song that literally says, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. But realistically, when we look at the power dynamics of this story and the privileges that we actually hold in our given context, it turns out that we're much more likely to be the community members who claim to not recognize the formerly blind person, or we're the religious leaders who interrogate the person who has experienced this miracle. In their Global Equality Analysis book, The Spirit Level, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson make the case that societies with vast inequalities mainly looking at income inequality, are bad for people at all levels of the social hierarchy, both the well-off and the poor. I want to note here that income inequality is a multifaceted and intersectional issue. It's impacted by things like age, race, education, sexuality, gender presentation, native language, and more. Given the time constraints of today's sermon, we'll be looking at it in a very general sense. So just be aware that there's still more work to do with that. These authors, Pickett and Wilson, look at 30 years of research from countries across the globe, and they conclude that increased inequality in a country leads to increased societal ills for everyone involved. The book highlights the, quote, pernicious effects that inequality has on societies, eroding trust, increased anxiety and illness, and encouraging excessive consumption, end quote. The book shows that for each of 11 different health and social problems, physical health, mental health, drug abuse, education, imprisonment, obesity, social mobility, trust in community life, violence, teenage pregnancies, and child well-being. All of these outcomes are significantly worse in more unequal rich countries. Pickett and Wilkinson stress in the spirit level that health is related to income levels within rich societies, not between different societies. In this graph, which I know is small, the U.S. is the far right bottom dot. We have both one of the highest national incomes per person, as well as one of the lowest life expectancies per person. This graph looks at how much richer are the richest 20% of a society than the poorest 20%. The U.S. is almost at the very bottom of this graph, meaning that we have one of the widest gaps between the rich and the poor at the time this data was taken. In the U.S., the richest 20% of our population are more than eight times richer than those in the poorest 20%. Eight times. Okay, okay, this is my last graph, I promise. This one shows the trend that is the driving force of the entire book, the spirit level. Health and social problems are worse in more unequal countries. The U.S. here is the top right dot. So it has the highest level of income inequality, as well as the highest levels of health and social problems, according to the data that was collected. What does this mean for us? In other words, the justice work that we engage in has tangible results. The level of equality in our society has a direct effect on our quality of life, as well as the quality of life for those around us. We as humans are more interconnected than we might even realize, and our mutual thriving is contingent on how we care for one another, something that this current pandemic has made starkly obvious. Our capitalist society stresses that we look out for number one, aka we look out for ourselves first. It tells us that it is okay to do whatever is necessary to get ahead, and it rewards those who abuse and discard other humans on the path to worldly riches. Our apathy towards justice upholds this capitalist vision of the world. And as Pickett and Wilkinson show in their book, this hurts everyone, including us. The comfortable, the lower middle class, the middle class, the upper middle class. The folks who have just enough privilege that we don't want to rock the boat. The first audience who would have heard the Gospel of John understood this interdependence too. In this narrative, Jesus' actions affected the entire community the person who regained their sight, the neighbors and community members who had their ideas of the blind person flipped upside down in an instant, the person's parents who were suddenly called in for questioning, and the religious leaders who had an issue in their community all of a sudden. 
This narrative, yes, talks about one human's literal journey from blindness to sight, as well as a wider cosmological journey from darkness to light. But it also speaks to the ripple effect that one person's actions have. All of God's creation is more intertwined than we could ever realize. Our narrative today shows us how many levels of society a status change can affect. As the narrative winds, the formerly blind person grows in presence and confidence, speaking more and more boldly to the people who question them. The community around them has to re-navigate their relationship to this person, as the beggar that they used to literally look down on is now engaging with them in a new way. Similarly, the religious leaders in this story deem this change a threat to the status quo and they rally to question this person's lived experiences and determine how to best respond to hold control. I'm going to let you in on a little secret today. In a capitalist society where property is valued more than people, what you spend your money on is a vote for your values. Like the book The Spirit Level argues, our lives are intricately connected to the status and the well-being of other people. So be intentional in your spending and your donating, and make sure that your money is creating the type of world that you want to live in. Two easy ways to do this are to, one, give to local organizations that advocate for all of God's people so that all of creation might share in God's abundant life. And two, Give to mutual aid initiatives to help people directly. Now, I'm obviously a student pastor in this congregation, so of course I think that donating money to this faith community is one way to make the world a more just and equitable one. For example, did you know that when you support First Congregational here in Fort Worth, your effect is, as UCC leader Reverend Karen Georgia Thompson would say, global. That is, it is both global and local. A portion of the money that you donate to this church stays right here in Fort Worth, working for justice in this community. But this congregation also chooses to support national social justice work that the United Church of Christ is involved in, like the current campaign that has abolished more than $12 million in medical debt for over 11,000 families in St. Louis alone, not to mention the current campaigns going on in Chicago and other major cities across the country. This church also donates a portion of its funds to support our church partners around the world, like those in Beirut, Lebanon, still reeling from the port explosion in early August. Supporting this congregation is a tangible way to vote with your dollars and be an active participant in creating a more just and equitable world for all. Another great way to vote with your dollars is to get involved in mutual aid work. What is mutual aid, you might be wondering? It's a voluntary reciprocal exchange of resources and services for mutual benefit. Mutual aid projects are a form of political participation in which people take responsibility for caring for one another and changing political conditions. As Haley, a queer therapist intern on Instagram, said recently, imagine what it would be like to exist within a community where mutual aid is the norm. She ponders us to Imagine struggling with your mental and or physical health and knowing that you could turn to someone in your community for support and resources. Imagine facing food insecurity and knowing that your community had easy access and accessible food sources for you. Imagine if you were struggling to pay your rent and you knew that your community would be there to help. In a tangible way, this work might look like buying supplies or donating extra things to Fort Worth's community fridge. It might look like following a local activist on social media and responding directly via PayPal or Venmo when they express a community need. Or it might look like checking in with your neighbors and creating open channels of communication so that you can support one another over time as needs arise. As worship winds down and begins to come to an end today, and we all prepare to return to our busy schedules and routines, I want y'all to get honest with yourself. How are you caring for your fellow humans? Are you caring in an active way, or are you taking a more passively compassionate role? Are you going to increase the flourishing of people around you, or are you going to impede upon it? This John narrative shows us that we have more of an effect on one another than we might initially guess. And it's up to you whether your life will contribute to this mutual flourishing or whether it will reinforce the status quo. Amen.